series presented by Library Strategies, Governance Structures and Best Practices, a dive into library foundation boards with the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Library Strategies is the consulting group of the Friends. We partner with library organizations nationally and internationally to cultivate their potential so that they can better serve and strengthen their communities. I'm Elaine Hopkins, Director of Library Strategies, and I'm so pleased to have you here with us today to delve into library foundation boards and fundraising. Each webinar features the Friends President, Beth Burns, in conversation with a pair of trustees. The stars of today's webinar, Fundraising and Your Foundation Board, are current board chair, Bridget Manahan, and former Institutional Engagement Committee Chair, Paul Dadlis. The trio will engage in conversation and take questions at the end, so please feel free to enter your questions into the chat as the program progresses. We will relay them to the presenters. Also, please share your name and where you're from in the chat. We would love to know more about you. If you'd like to take advantage of captioning, please choose that option from the menu bar on your screen. So now, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters. Bridget Manahan is the recently retired senior commercial banker. Most recently, she was the director of commercial banking at American National Bank for the Minnesota market. Bridget holds a Bachelor of Business Administration from St. Catherine University and has served on the Friends Board for six years. Her other trustee experience includes chairing the boards of Creighton Durham Hall High School and the Alumni Association of St. Catherine University as a member of the boards of Women Venture, the Upper Midwest Chapter of the Turnaround Management Association and St. Catherine University. Paul Dadlas is the Wealth Advisory Services Director and Lead Financial Advisor for Alaris, a company he joined in 2013. He practiced law for six years and has spent the greater portion of his career as a wealth management advisor, where he specializes in private banking, personal trust, and financial planning. He holds a bachelor's degree in communication arts from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a master's degree in business from the University of St. Thomas School of Business, and a Juris Doctor degree from Hamlin University School of Law. His previous board service includes three full terms with the Friends, Everybody Wins, and he currently serves on the Hamlin University Board of Trustees. And finally, Beth Burns has served as president of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library for five years. Her prior, prior nonprofit experience includes leadership roles with the Minnesota Zoo, Guthrie Theater, Lutheran Music Program, and McPhail Center for Music. As a trustee, she's served on numerous boards, including Minnesota Citizens for the Arts, 15 Head Theater Lab, the Minnesota Association, Association for Arts Educators, and she's a co-founder and officer of the nonprofit Minnesota Music Coalition. Beth is currently a member of the Metropolitan Library Service Agency Board of Trustees. And now please take it away, Beth. Thanks, Elaine, and thank you to Bridget and Paul for being with us this afternoon. This is our second, and we had such a good time. Um, I wanna welcome back I, I see familiar names in the chat who were with us during our first conversation with my with other board colleagues, Heather and Armando, but today we're really going to focus on fundraising. Um, and I am very fortunate in my role as president of the Friends to work with a stellar board of directors that is unapologetic about its work as a fundraising organization. And fundraising always starts with us as people, individuals and our own choices and passions. And so I want to, before we sort of jump into the nuts and bolts of library fundraising, I want to ask each of you to sort of speak to your personal philanthropic heart. What do you, what do you say yes to and why um, when someone is fundraising on, on behalf of an organization and asking you for support? What prompts you to lean in and say yes? And Bridget, I will ask you first. Well, thank you, Beth. And uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. And I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the webinar this afternoon. I really have three um, kind of criteria, personal criteria I think about um, when I am considering making a, a contribution or an investment. And first of all, I need to be inspired. I'm gonna, I need to be inspired by the mission. Uh, I need to understand impact. 
and I consider financial sustainability. So with respect to my commitment to the Friends and therefore the libraries of the city of St. Paul, the libraries match up with my history of commitment to education, to building community, and to the literary arts. I am a fan of writers and writing. Um, with respect to impact, the Friends were able to demonstrate to me the numbers of families that are served by the St. Paul Public Libraries, be it through homework help programs, be it through story time on Saturdays or internet access. And finally, so I, I think about financial sustainability in terms of demonstrated financial responsibility on the part of the organization and an understanding, my, my ability to understand that my donor dollars are furthering the mission. So those are my you know, personal criteria. Wow, that's great. Thank you so much, Bridget. Paul, how about you? What leads you to yes? Yeah, I would, I would have to reiterate a lot of what Bridget has said to her drivers for me. Over the years, I, I think it was an evolutionary process for me. I used to say yes to everything, unfortunately. <laughs> it doesn't work, right? Um, so over time, I think I've developed a desire to really engage and support organizations that are in, you know, involved in missions that are near and dear to my heart, literacy, uh, you know, libraries, I've spent many hours of my life in libraries, I love them, and, and, uh, and so it's, you know, that was, it, it's marrying up those types of service organizations and their impact, as, as Bridget indicated, uh, you know, it's been a running, probably joke, they, they say it's a compliment, but I, I'm, you know, my name could be interchanged with impact, 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 because that's really been my mantra is uh, whenever I engage with uh, partners, it's trying to determine what's the best and most efficient way to allocate resources in a way that's going to meet the community needs. And I think that that is really a driver in how I look at uh, organizations and, and the impacts they're having is, are they um, really the best organization to help affect the outcomes within the community that I'm looking to see happen? Um, and so that's really um, an overarching driver on how I determine how I will make both contributions financially or, uh, you know, in, in time and effort. That's great. Um, I think we're, I'm very comfortable with what I sense are going to be recurring themes in this afternoon's conversation, mission and impact. Um, if that's all the further we got with the conversation about fundraising, I think there's deep value in just really centering around those two words to get started. Well, you guys have both said yes to philanthropy um, and to making personal and on behalf of your corporations um, financial gifts to the friends and therefore benefiting the library, but you also each said yes to serving as a trustee. And given the conversation and who's with us in the room this afternoon, I really want to spend a little bit of time thinking about fundraising and framing that from a trustee perspective. And as executive, the executive, the president of the friends, um, it is so important for a nonprofit organization to be able to say, that its board members are at the table, that you are fully participating in the work of the organization. And when the work of the organization is to raise funds for your library on behalf of your community, your board needs to be first in line. Otherwise you're in a really awkward do as I say, not as I do scenario. Bridget, I would love to turn to you and ask for you to just share some thoughts um, around how do you set up a board of directors, a board of trustees for a foundation, for a friends group, for a library board to really understand and appreciate and um, engage in the responsibility of philanthropy? Okay, I'm gonna begin by talking about, rather than talking about philanthropy specifically, I'm going to talk about board engagement. Okay. And I think philanthropy on the part of individual trustees or board members falls under that umbrella of board engagement. When we invite a prospective board member, we are inviting someone to join our board because of their wisdom, their leadership, or their experience, and they have said yes for a variety of reasons. Hopefully they have a passion for libraries, they most certainly have an interest, 
but they may have other community reasons, whatever it is. Um, with respect to um, successful board experiences, my personal experience and my observation is that deeply engaged board members are board members who have the best experience, have the most gratifying experience. And engagement means a handful of things. It means a commitment to being present at meetings and being prepared at meetings. It means a commitment to committee work, if that is the case. It might mean participation or attendance at programming or fundraising events. And along with that, it means the commitment to making a personal gift. Now, um, a personal gift uh, means different things to different board members. Mm -hmm. A personal gift may mean in terms of dollar amount, a personal gift, uh, I think the way we talk about it is meaningful, to that individual. And as I think I said earlier, Paul, meaningful might be different to somebody who has three kids and they're paying college tuition for all three than it is for someone who does not, who does not have that other financial commitment. So, so um, that's how I think about philanthropy on the part of the board as, a, as under that engagement umbrella. Perfect. Um, I, I think that engagement piece is so clear. And we, in our, so I'm gonna actually add to that. One of the things we talked about during the governance seminar was the importance of having a board job description and not masking or hiding the fact that fundraising is part of what we do and that full participation by the board is an expectation. And we do ground it in that idea of what is a personally meaningful gift. and. Um, I appreciate your three kids in college reference because Paul, I'm not, I'll just out you, Paul. Paul's got triplets um, <laughs> and a fair amount of college tuition <laughs> on the on the books, I'm guessing. And so um, it does, it changes for individuals and the board, if it is representative of the community, should be inclusive of folks who have personal wealth such that they can make what would be by anybody's standards a really significant gift. But a personally meaningful gift can also mean $50 to a school teacher in her second year of teaching, but whose voice, like you said, you want at the table as a trustee. And I'll be honest, we on the Friends Board, we have a board member who makes a two-figure gift, and I know that that is a sacrificial gift for her. And we have a board member who makes a five-figure gift, and I know he could do more and not bat an eyelash. Mm -hmm. So it it really is that idea of personally meaningful. Paul, let me turn to you and sort of ask beyond the sort of clear expectation, beyond that hiding from it, beyond this idea that philanthropy is just one piece of board service, what would you like to add from your experience or, or from the chair you're sitting in as a trustee and former trustee? Well, I mean, kind of touching on the idea of board engagement in the form of, you know, participation, it's, as we're trying to make the message to our institutional partners on uh, impact, you know, we want to show that that's something that's near and dear to every board member's heart, that they believe in the mission and the impact that the organization's having, and they're putting dollars behind that themselves at the level that's meaningful to them. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, because I, I kind of view it as uh, the three T's, treasure, toil, and time. And I think that those are the things that govern, you know, what I feel is a very engaged and active member. And they're all in varying degrees because as Beth talked about in the spectrum of, of uh, ability to contribute on a dollar level, I can tell you that there are also individuals that even if they're only doing two digit donations are doing uh, seven figure donations of time. And mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's all, you know, impact in, in different ways through different lenses. And I think that that's, I like organizations and, and uh, you know, the most effective ones that I've observed are the ones that have, uh, you know, a mastery of the combination of those three teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point because we shouldn't just be stock, you know, stocking up on board members who can write big checks because then you aren't going to have effective ambassadors in other ways in the community. So I think that's a really good point. I think just as a, as a from a really practical standpoint, um, I know in Minnesota, and, I, and actually I, I know this is true across the country, 
that there are numerous foundations and corporations to which we apply for for grants. And you have to check a box on the application form that says, do you have 100% participation from your board of directors? So even though we're going to be talking about fundraising broadly, I think when I think about where does fundraising start and where does it go out into the community? Yes, you, we have to be able to say, I give, I hope you'll give. But we also have that as a litmus test in our field. In the nonprofit field, it is a frequent question on grant applications. And for those of us who, who maybe are more squeamish about asking for money, we can sometimes hide behind that a little bit and just be like, I need you to make a gift because checking that box of yes, we have 100% board participation is so important. And it's not there gratuitously. Foundations want to know, is your board of directors engaged and at the right. table for the work, for the mission of the organization? Um, so I again, I I encourage you to recognize that even from far beyond the gifts themselves, they represent something larger across, uh, across the community and, and across our, our various um, channels that from which we can raise funds. The well, and I just, I was gonna say Beth, I would just like to um, echo a word that Paul used. And that is, as we talk about the role of board members and that is as ambassador. Mm -hmm. We all know that the list of board members for nonprofits appears on websites, it appears here and there. And so as ambassadors, just echoing what you're saying, the ability to um, demonstrate commitment and leadership and model that behavior is significant. Yep, indeed. And it also attracts other people to the organization as well. Um, I remember going to a workshop really early in my career. And I think that this sort of ratio still holds true that no matter how, if, if you've got a good board, like a good a good being balanced across that whole spectrum of engagement, fundraising from your board of directors in a healthy annual giving program should make up about 20% of your total annual fund. That generally is a good litmus test of do 20% of all the gifts we receive come from our board of trustees, individual giving, not all sources of revenue, but just that individual giving, because then you probably have representation of your major donors, of your individual entry level donors, of new donors, of like long time, very loyal, but maybe not major gift level donors. And so that is something that we kind of look to not as the standard, but a lens through which to look at fundraising. So Paul, I'm gonna turn now, oh, I'm gonna say one more thing about individuals and boards. You know what it is really easy to forget to do if you sit in my chair as, as president of an organization? It's easy to forget to say thank you to those who are closest to you. It's the same reason like I, I forget to tell my husband that I love him sometimes when I really do, but somebody else will say something nice to him. I forget sometimes that those of you who are closest to the organization also need to hear thank you. and. I, I am grateful for my board every single day, but sometimes when we talk about, oh, it's in your board job description, it's just an expectation. It also matters for those of us who did the asking, whether it's peer to peer, like board member to board member asking, or if it's an administrative role from within the library staff, or if you are fortunate to have foundation staff paid positions, remember that those thank yous to board members should also be your you know, most heartfelt thank yous in the same way that their gifts are the closest and most loyal gifts to the organization. So I'm just gonna note that, that thank you as, is at least as important, if not more than the ask. Um, but now I'm gonna shift gears. So Paul, when you were on our board of directors, which was right up until December 31st of 2021, the term limits, but we talked about the benefit of term limits and good governance at our last seminar. And unfortunately that means sometimes you lose a really, really great board member to time, but we keep you close in other ways. Anyway, while you were chair uh, or on the board, you chaired the Institutional Engagement Committee for a number of years. And I experienced that work as transformative to how we really thought about fundraising, um, how the board interacted with our corporate and business community. I'm not gonna do a lot more of a preamble, but I really wanna, have you lean into that Paul Impact Dadlets as you introduced yourself and speak a little bit to 
why library organizations, library foundations can really think about their business community as a viable fundraising resource and corporate partner. Um, yeah, thanks, Beth. I, you know, um, it, to me, I think part of that, as Bridget indicated, us us serving in a role of ambassador, it's it's to understand those um, ways and and be able to message them. But to me, it just seemed when I joined the organization and and the meaning of libraries to me, it seemed logical that all of the things that we are out there messaging and ambassadoring to our uh, institutional partners, to me, was almost self evident and obvious. But it it, it wasn't because we had a hard time, you know, trying year over year to get re-engagement from some of our partners and continued commitments and things like that. And it was trying to get to the handle of why there was that annual challenge uh, to re-engage or to uh, uh, constantly have to uh, go asking. And, and it started me on a path that just uh, in working with my clients in the business that I work in and, and planning and finding out what drives my, my own clients, philanthropic motivations, I, I learned and, and started to understand more that the industry, um, or I should say uh, commercial or corporate partnerships were really changing the way they give and they were thinking of it differently. It used to be where companies would set up foundations, write a check, you know, and they would just decide, okay, apply every year to our foundation group. But it became more of a marketing and, and you know, kind of brand development arm for a lot of companies, my own included, where they wanted to make sure that they were allocating resources to have impacts within the communities they serve as a way to say this is consistent with our values and mm -hmm. our um, things that we're trying to see accomplished. And it started getting me and others on our committee to think about um, those um, points that resonate with our institutional partners on making the case. So building the case statement for why libraries and library support organizations um, matter and why they should partner with us. And, and it started to become more, not just about using the word impact, we have an efficient and, and meaningful way with which to impact the community, but it's talking to them about what they're looking for, what's the world in which they want to live and look like, and taking those and marrying them to the actual facts and impacts that the friends and the library in our area is having on the community. And I think what happened during COVID was it just magnified um, those uh, impacts, right? Um, you know, I mean, libraries, you know, not only are they community gathering spots and opportunities to help, uh, you know, um, develop uh, literacy and knowledge and all of these other things, but they also became points to help meet the gap in workforce development, uh, digital equity, all of these things that we've been engaged in that we weren't very, uh, I don't want to say strategic, but we weren't as strategic as we could have been in, in making that case. So I would say that the staff and friends were fantastic because when we started to have these, it was more of a free form, uh, you know, riffing and, and idea uh, discussion that needed structure behind it. And I can tell you, uh, the friends heard because the staff did an excellent job of taking the sort of ideas that we had on our mind of things we wanted to see, like data to support the impacts, the case mm -hmm. statements needed to be made to message the impacts, um, and, and really show that any partner making a commitment to this organization knew exactly that this was money well spent. It was going to be uh, beneficial and impactful in some form within the communities they are trying to build. And, um, and so we started to do more of that messaging and it was an easy sell and it helped us all. I can say myself anyway, and Bridget, you can speak to that too, but it made it easier for us to be ambassadors, quite frankly, which was the best part of it. Right. Um, I think what I remember we were sitting in a meeting together and we sort of honed in on this idea of where is the intersection of that mutual self-interest and, yeah. and, and that idea of like, what do libraries care and work toward that corporations care and work toward and that sweet spot, we hadn't done a great job of naming like, oh yeah, you need an educated workforce. Guess what we do? We educate the workforce. You need a safe community so that employees want to live there and you can reach, you know, you're retaining employees and, and able to attract employees to your community. 
libraries contribute to that because that's the work that we do every day. I mean, we just sort of clicked through a ton of those spaces that we share in common and we wrote it down, we found data, we found pictures, we made a brochure and we, we've we used that, what do you think four years now? Yeah, and I can tell you, I mean, Beth, you can speak to that and I'm sure Greg Giles, who's very dialed into that, that the, the turnaround time for commitments and engagement uh, is is much shorter, right? I think mm -hmm. that getting to yes and getting, uh, in, in some cases, I've even believed that we've even had some partner organizations that have solicited us saying, you know, when is this, you know, gonna happen yep. again or how can we help support in the next wave? And those are great because that just shows you they're out ambassadoring as well and they're paying attention now and they're coming to us uh, ready to partner. Mm -hmm. and, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and it has been, we've been doing it for four years, but I think with great success and it really was something that made an abbreviated engagement need during COVID even, I think, easier. Yeah. Right? Well, and I would say that um, that ability to tell the story in a meaningful way um, is great with our institutional partners. It's, it's, I would say our individual givers as well are consistently um, more sophisticated, looking for more information around impact. And it's been very helpful there as well. So that was great work you did. Well, and it's fun when you do stuff. I mean, we all do things that we all hope will make a difference but i mean this was sort of like tapping into uh an entrepreneurial idea that just started to take flight on its own and, and i can commend the staff for just really jumping on it and taking mm -hmm. advantage of it because it has had a meaningful impact yeah, yeah i'm i'm just going to actually specifically name while we're in this part of the conversation thinking about businesses we sort of hung that case statement on six points of shared interest um, and so to just drive them home, we talked about the library as a workforce development resource. We talked about the library as a resource for digital inclusion. And I'm sure whether you, I see we've got a lot of folks on this call today who are in rural communities where the conversations you're having about broadband are nuanced, but not dissimilar to very urban conversations about broadband access and internet access. And, and as we all know, I mean, we're all sitting here today on Zoom. You don't have the internet right now, you got nothing and you have no connection to the business community, much less any of the other resources we need to access now more than ever. So we talked about the library as a resource for digital inclusion, educational support system. Heather, you mentioned homework centers earlier in your own um, reflections, but sort of how we shore up the education um, community. Uh, library is a public safety solution. Again, corporations care deeply. We have had very clear experience, direct experience in the Twin Cities in the last three years about what public safety, what community stability, what streets on fire, frankly, look like, what social unrest and political unrest can turn into very quickly. And to have libraries as havens and places to go where you feel safe and where you can get accurate information, where kids can go after school and be spending time in safe supportive environments. We are, we are part of this public safety conversation in our community now. Um, we talk about libraries as community resources, again, enhancements and how do you attract and retain your upper level management and senior people to a community. Strong libraries look good in communities. And then that idea of library as a resource for equity and inclusion, something that I think all communities are wrestling with, but we named it and then we shopped it. And some companies care much more deeply about one aspect of that case statement and others grab onto another. And um, I would see our board members and those committee members just really responding and sort of leaning into what their personal area of interest was and, you know, know your audience, listen. And it was, it's been fun. It has been, and it's been, I almost would argue it's an exponential impact in the sense that it used to be where we would, you know, in any one of these six areas, we would hope one of those re messages would resonate with somebody in the way that we approached it. Mm -hmm. Now, as Beth has indicated, you know, when they look through these, they may not all resonate, but at least they can find something that they really feel is important. And so it's resulted in, you know, where we were hoping one would answer yes, we've got multiple buy-in mm -hmm. now for mm -hmm. initiatives. And that's 
something that I can say in the decade of time I was working with the board, definitely we saw transpire into a, a much better case statement to be made and a better response, so. Right. Um, I'm gonna really look at another side of corporate philanthropy for a second, which is the role of the corporate sponsorship. So I think a lot of us still are doing events in which we solicit sponsorships, you know, buy a table at our gala or sponsor book plates or, you know, sponsor a library branch. Um, both of you represent companies that the Friends has been super grateful for um, as underwriters of, of our events. And I guess I would love a little insight from each of you. How does that process, how does that decision making work inside your own businesses? Like what criteria or standards do you do? Because it's different than that case statement, that mission connection in some respects, because it is about sort of how you show up in the community. Can you guys speak a little bit to sort of what the vetting and discernment process is around kind of the more traditional sponsorships for which we are still really grateful and rely on? Hmm. Well, I'll take a I'll take a shot at that. Um, with respect to my my most recent experience, I was with a uh, a local bank more recently that was uh, had 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 and has I am retired as Elaine noted just recently, but a very strong commitment to um, uh, economic development in its it specifically economic development in the Twin Cities of mm -hmm. Minneapolis, St. Paul, and a real commitment to the institutions in the city of St. Paul. And so had a long commitment to um, our gala event, Opus and Olives, mm -hmm. and um, being a sponsor at that event. Uh, that was uh, an event where, um, a, we could sponsor we could sponsor the friends in the library. B, it was nice visibility for the bank. C, it afforded us the ability to entertain clients. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, very practically, it was um, um, it was a wonderful opportunity that that met multiple kinds of objectives. Um, my sense is, on a go forward basis, that those kinds of events galas, those kinds of sponsorships are, are in light of COVID a little bit more challenging. Yes. So <laughs> I would I would not speculate as to what the future is, but I think, you know, historically it came under the umbrella of commitment to the community. This is our library we're in. So thank you. Paul, anything you'd add? Yeah, I would. I mean, in addition to what Bridget has said, we were doing similar things. I mean, uh, an organization, I mean, the events that um, our, my organization was big on supporting was the Minnesota Book Awards, which was mm -hmm. tied to what they would classify as part of our fundamental four pillars that we look to that are dealing with, you know, um, uh, food, uh, housing, education, uh, you know, and, and uh, a lot of it had to do with financial fitness since we're a bank and, and uh, mm -hmm. financial institution. It was trying to build, you know, make sure that uh, people within the community we serve are, um, you know, on the right path and, and, and the like. And so even though we did a lot of the same reasons of buying tables and things that, you know, Bridget outlined, and it was a great marketing event and a great ent entertainment event for clients to associate them to such a great signature event, it still deviated more. And now we're kind of looking at still looking at those those pillars what's mm -hmm. the impact of the organization because there's a lot of organizations that throw fundraisers and galas and they're great um, but some organizations after the gala is over are better at serving the community than others yeah i guess that's the way to put it the the other thing i would offer is that i think it's helpful it's important um to have an advocate on behalf of the organization. For instance, to have an advocate, in my case, at American National Bank on behalf of the Friends of the St. Paul Public mm -hmm. Library, yep. to have a voice that speaks internally um, uh, through your process on behalf of the nonprofit. Yeah, I will say, I'm, so that's a really good point. And we are super fortunate at the Friends in St. Paul that we can claim, yeah, we have you an advocate on our board of directors, same with Paul. 
um, which gives me sort of a moment of like, hmm, reflection to sort of say out loud, we have a really big board of directors at the Friends. And I would challenge everybody who's on this call today to sort of as one of the ways you're thinking about your fundraising goals, your overall engagement goals, like how are you showing up in the community goals? Um, I think board size is really something to reflect upon and sort of ask, does the organization structure, the board structure reflect, and is it ready to meet the needs of the library and the mission itself? Because I was very skeptical when I started in this role of like, why in the world is there a 50 person board of directors? But now I would fight to, to the nail to keep that board size because it means I've got 50 ambassadors. It's a lot of work. I mean, we have a ton of committees with a lot of governance structure, et cetera, but it also opens so many doors to have 50 ambassadors to your point. I have an advocate at multiple banks. I mean, you two, I suppose theoretically are competitors, but everybody shows up for the library, you know, with lots of goodwill. So I think board size and sort of the role of the board in your fundraising program is, a, is worth considering. and sort of the, the advocacy that comes with that level of engagement and the ambassadorship that comes with that level of engagement is, it's, a, it's worth reflecting on. I think that's a great point because I can say having served on um, many boards uh, by now that this one is the largest I've ever served on. And as I've told you about time and again, and this isn't because we're trying to create a mutual admiration society here right now, but it's a true statement. It's probably the most effective board I've ever served on in that because of the idea that we know, uh, you know, what the roles are in the sense of being ambassadors, understanding a clear case statement and mission and uh, what we're trying to do and engaging the community. It's really, everybody's just ready to go out and, and uh, you know, message and, and, and get the word out and get the, uh, you know, partnerships um, and, uh, uh, engagement going. And I think that that's been very, very good. It's also been very, as a result, been able to act very, very nimbly in moments of crisis. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good it point. It was a call to action for everybody. Um, and everybody was willing to ready and ready to step in and, and really help uh, in light of the changing environment. And that was also something that emphasized to me why, um, you know, it's a really highly functioning and a very effective group. Um, and I think that's in large part due to, like I said, the clarity of the mission and, yeah. and we're out there doing. Well, and I mean, the good thing is that everybody who's with us this afternoon is doing library work. So foundationally, there isn't a person on this webinar today who foundationally doesn't have a really strong case to make. And so I want to transition and we will have time for Q&A. So please, I would encourage folks who maybe have thoughts um, rumbling around, like put them into the chat, that'll help Elaine and I know what your questions are. Um, but the question I wanna ask each of you with that is, what excites you about funding the library and what tools do you as a trustee need to participate in those fundraising efforts? Like what, it, what is most helpful for you and what is the most sort of, what excites you about this work on behalf of libraries? I'll jump in. What what it excites me right now uh, more than ever before is the role of libraries in communities. I really feel like libraries are places where all are welcome right now, mm -hmm. and all are welcome with a variety of different um, purposes for being there, goals and objectives for being there. And everyone's welcome. Everyone has access to um, this wealth of resources we have in our libraries. So that really excites me. And I'm very passionate about that. And was there a second part to that question, Beth? Well, just thinking about, so what tools do you as a trustee want from us? Um, or what do you, oh, what do you uh, need to do effective fundraising? Here's what I would say. I would go back to the impact piece. And this might be my background as a banker, but when I can talk about numbers of households that we serve, of kids that come for homework help over at the Rondo branch, or 
family story time on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Those programs um, that um, speak to creating access for individual families and, and uh, citizens in St. Paul and the numbers around those, I think, I think that's great information and um, just supports the case. Super. Paul? I would agree. I mean, I use the example of digital inclusion, just that we went through the last couple of years, the initial call to action was just trying to meet the gap and through a lot of, you know, um, help with um, mobile hotspots and things like that, that people could sign out. And, and we could have congratulated ourselves quite well on that alone if we wanted to and stop right there. But what it did was it just opened up the urgency for uh, longer term digital inclusion discussions on how we permanently meet those gaps through expanded uh, technology uh, installs and uh, infrastructure spending and things like that. So it's even, and I can say, Beth, you know, you know, as we're talking about um, facility um, uh, changes and, and capital uh, fundraising initiatives and things that uh, probably the ask in reference to certain facilities prior to COVID might be changed considerably to what mm -hmm. we're asking for now in reference to technology and services and the way we deliver those services yep. to the community. So that's also, I think, part of it as well. And I, um, you know, I just use that as an example to just show really mm -hmm. how this is, it's a fluid environment and it's right. To pay attention, but it's all good. And I think the nice part I see is that this is really emphasized and, and um, uh, really put out there that libraries are relevant. Uh, yeah. I, and anybody that thought otherwise um, now understands clearly. I'm so glad that you said that because I think one of the things that I have encountered, and I even think back to my own interview for my role here and, and sort of like, oh, I'm sort of surprised I got the job because I'll be honest, I came to the, this role with a fairly romantic and antiquated idea of the work of libraries because I... I, I think you were saying, Bridget, I am a passionate reader. I am a lover of language. I, I can just like, you know, I just love books. I love the smell of books. I love the written words. Certain sentences just are exquisite. And that's my intersection with the library. But boy, was I, I was out of touch with how libraries are showing up for community now. And I think to name Paul, just that relevance, both of you have spoken to this in different ways. I think one of the best things that we can do for ourselves, for our, for our board and for our communities is just make sure that we don't take for granted that people have a correct idea of what library is in 2021. And certainly in a post-COVID environment, um, the data point that I um think about and and I think that there was a lot of skepticism like our library is still relevant our library is still meaningful why should we fund libraries libraries are supported by tax dollars you don't need any more tax dollars all of those narratives when COVID hit there was then the additional narrative of like well now you're not even open curbside pickup woohoo but I, I know that a lot of us here this afternoon, because I can see who's sort of on this call, our libraries were, talk about nimble and pivoting and all those watchwords of 2020 and 2021. We used to talk, in when I first started at the Friends, we told the story of story times at the library and how there were all these story times every week and, and the St. Paul Public Sto Library offered story times for families in nine different languages and wasn't that amazing. Um, I remember the week that everything closed down in March of 2020, by the last week of March, the very first online program that St. Paul Public Library started offering was Family Story Times Online. And they were terrible. I mean, it was like barely a camera and we kind of were learning what Zoom was and all of that. But at the end of the first week of online story times, we had 4,000 people that had attended. After our first month, it was like 28,000 people had attended virtual story times. We had nowhere near that impact live and in person. And yes, you lose something. But to realize that that adaptability and the library's starting point of always asking the question, what does our community need us to be in this moment? That's the thing I can raise money on all day because the library never stops asking that question. Um, we have a question and it is from someone on with us today. It says, what are some ideas of where you start on recruitment 
when building the sense of, or building the strengths of your foundation for fundraising, knowing that's a goal. So how do you build the bench? Like, how do you build a strong board for fundraising? Oh, that is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do is, uh, I, have, I have an immediate thought and I can let you guys think about your answer if you want me to jump in first. Go ahead, Beth. I would look at the two of you as my examples of like, who just is jazzed? Like, where is the excitement and the energy for the work? And then is that person on your board? Or like, who do you see in the library? What check comes in that's a surprise? Who says, who is the easiest yes in your fundraising portfolio that you know it's gonna be the first gift in the year or just look for the passion. Um, and I've, if you follow passion, you will find probably a really good trustee. Um, and then you ask that person, who else do you know that cares deeply about this work? Who should we share this story with? Mm -hmm. I will agree with that. And I will echo your comment on networking. Mm -hmm. You know, I came to this board through someone else Me who too. was on this board, who I had a huge amount of respect and admiration for. And in addition to being passionate about libraries, it was really appealing to work with this person. Mm -hmm. And so, um, um, networking is key, I think, on a mature board. Um, when you're starting out, I think um, that's exactly right, Beth. Identifying somebody who has the passion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I would agree. I, you know, I was uh, brought onto the board through somebody else also who was passionate about this organization, but also um, libraries. And it was just over the discussion of libraries and the city in general, because we both have an affinity for St. Paul, um, that he just said, you know, I think uh, you'd be a good add to the organization. And I didn't really know a lot about the Friends prior to first getting introduced way back when. So it was a real uh, um, opportunity for me to learn mm -hmm. more and, and the impact at that time uh, that they were having. And, um, and I, yeah, and I've spent time identifying and looking for similar types of individuals that have that sense of passion about community building, even if it's not just about the libraries right. in general to uh, really look to them and, you know, and, and we're all pressed for time. So I actually know that we've had a lot of leaders within our organization that we brought on through, you know, uh, very visible organizations within our community that um, were just as eager to be involved in an impactful organization as well that would basically mm -hmm. be a, uh, an efficient use of their time so that they could come in and say, you know, what do you need me to do? How can I help support this, this mission? Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say that that's in line with what I've been thinking with respect to, you know, how we attract those types of individuals to our organization. Two things I think about as I listen to the two of you is one, um, from a very nuts and bolts standpoint, the friends now at our May board meeting every year, um, we spend a significant amount of time at our May board meeting coming into the room, knowing we're gonna do a recruitment brainstorming exercise. And what we do is identify here are the qualities and characteristics. Some years you need a new, another lawyer because your lawyer rotated off. Some years your bankers all go away and you need to populate your finance committee. Um, and, and we talk, uh, we almost write up like profiles of we're looking for individuals who, and you could write, we're looking for individuals who are never afraid, like, hey, can you donate to my silent auction? Or, hey, will you bring something to the church potluck? Or, hey, can you come um, volunteer at the football game? If those are people who are already out in the community asking for exactly what Paul's speaking to, it's community engagement. It might look different. It's not library related. But who's the, who is already out there sort of looking to make their community better? Um, write up that job description and then really ask people like, who do you know that fits this profile? Like you're profiling. Um, and then just start having lots of cups of coffee. Don't go one day, like I got your name and the next day, would you like to join the board? It's a courtship of, have you been in a library lately? Would you visit a library with me sometime? I'd love to show you what's happening in the library. I'd love to introduce you to the library director, et cetera, et cetera. And 
we bring on new board members in January. So that's how long. May is when we have those first conversations. And then we spend the better part of a year doing recruitment. The other thing I would say is I would rather have a passionate representative from a business than the CEO. Um, it's great to have the CEO's name on letterhead, but if that CEO doesn't have the bandwidth or the passion for the library, then they're never going to be as fully engaged as maybe that person a couple levels down in the organization who's going to be very motivated to be an effective part of that board. And so I'm really happy about that um, as well. Okay, here is a question. When recruiting new board prospects, what uh oh, now I just lost my own question. When recruiting new prospects, where did that question go? E says, is what, is, what is the most politic, politic sensitive way to probe the person's willingness to give a meaningful personal gift? Oh, thanks, Paul. <laughs> so, tag team here. Tag team, where'd it go? Yeah, it just says we have some people who fit the profile but are not the gregarious sort, how do you train new trustees to share the library's messaging and fundraising priorities with would-be donors in the most energizing way possible? You know, my, my opinion, and I think that's why having a mission state, you know, the, the case statements are really important because of that uh, different personality type. You have a lot of people that are very, very concerned that they don't have that ability to, to have that passion and clarity of thought and so the case statement makes it a lot easier for them because it really gives them a clear indication of things they can just, mm -hmm. you know, reiterate. And, and the passion speaks for itself because you're just saying these impacts are meaningful um, and, and significant. And I think that that's helped mm -hmm. with the, I think you said the non-gregarious sort, um, be able to still make a very strong case and, yeah. and very much ambassador of uh, the, the, the message. You know, going back to what you said just a few minutes ago, Beth, I think this, like so many other things, is about relationship building. Mm -hmm. um, even if you don't happen to be a gregarious person, you can, with a case statement, tell your friend the story and invite them to experience the library in yeah. some way. And it might be by coming to an event. It might be uh, what it, coming to an online event whatever that is, but mm -hmm. in uh, inviting them in the door so they have their own experience and introduce them to some others. And as I say, one of the reasons that I enjoy being on the Friends uh, board so much is I get to work with some really terrific people like Paul and mm -hmm. Beth. And um, so it's, it's, it's a process over time. Right. Yeah. It's not an event. Well, and it's not like every day of your life on the board is going to be picking up the phone and asking 10 people for money. So I think there's that, too. It's a piece, not the piece. And right. I guess one of the things I would say is that we have been really purposeful about making sure you guys have the tools that you need. So it's like, do you have a good Facebook page that you're like, go check out our Facebook page? and learn more about what our organization is doing or go check out our Instagram account and look at all these pictures of kids at the homework center. It is having that printed case statement that's really focused on the business community. It's also board job descriptions. So it's when, you are, when you're sitting down with a prospective board member, because I saw that question, like how do you broach you know, the politic of asking someone for a personally meaningful gift? If you have to just sit there and say it, face to face with someone, that's one thing. But if you're like, I'd like to walk through the board job description and talk with you about all the ways we hope to engage you as a board member, then you then it's a bullet point in a series of bullet points. And it doesn't look like I'm just asking you for all your money and that's it. And the rest of it's pretend needs. Um, exactly. You can just sort of speak to it as like, and we really, this is important. I And, and here's what it is. I make a personally meaningful gift. The amount I give may be completely different what, than what you're going to be able to give when you think about what is a personally meaningful gift for you. Um, but we all do step up and do that. It is really important you be able to say, I do this. I hope you would be comfortable doing this too. Um, we have some people. Okay, the, that's the gregarious. Carolyn's asking, has your foundation done a capital campaign do to do much needed renovations? Why, yes. If so, did everyone on the foundation participate or how did you build 
and work with the Capital Campaign Committee? Oh, I love this question and I don't know the answer yet because we are right in the middle of it. Um, our organization started a feasibility study uh, just this past fall that we are in the midst of right now. And our task force meets tomorrow morning, as a matter of fact, and, or Wednesday morning. And um, we made sure that that task force is populated with current and former board members, as well as non-board members of the business community and foundation uh, representatives from our community. And I know that our past capital campaigns have not had full 100% board giving. We get really close, but again, we had not in previous capital campaigns focused on you know, the $50 gift wasn't going to get the roof built, but we are going to do um, much, uh, I hope a much better and deeper job of community-based fundraising with this next campaign so that there's a real sense of ownership for all those facility improvements um, across, across our community and deeper into the organization. So I see that we're going to do that. Um, and I want to speak a little bit to the networking and the, this is going to be sort of like, I can't get off this call without speaking to this, um, just from a mission standpoint for us. Networking, yes, um, is, is so very important. And I, I think it's just important at this point to name, though, that most library friends groups, most library friend foundation boards are founded and populated by a historically white upper middle class community members and when we're networking, because look at it, even who's on this call today. Um, when we're networking, we're often networking with folks who look like us, who live in our communities. And, and so diversity becomes really challenging um, to achieve and creating a, an inclusive environment um, in your board, because I think increasingly that's going to be as much of a litmus test as um, as 100% board giving, I think corporations and foundations are gonna be looking to say is your board representative of the community. So I do want us to be mindful and also not making assumptions about like, oh, this part of our community doesn't give. We should be asking ourselves, have we asked that part of our community to give? And if the they is not the we, then how do we bring those things into closer relationships? So I, in our organization, we're trying to move away from like certain groups being underrepresented in our fundraising to really asking ourselves about, have we historically excluded anyone from the opportunity to give to our work? So I think that could be a whole different series, but I think in all the work we do now, you have to be applying this lens of equity diversity and inclusion if we're going to be relevant. I think it's existential for us at this point. So I do just want to name that as well. Um, we're at time and I know we could probably spend more time together, but um, thank you to both of you. And I don't know, Elaine, do you want a final thought or are you just kind of like, we're done? I don't, where are we? What would you like us to do? Well, I would like to have a final thought, which is to say thank you to Beth for moderating this conversation. Thank you, Bridget and Paul. We're really grateful that you have spent your time with us um, this afternoon and shared your experiences as trustees for the Friends and other organizations. We're also really grateful to everyone who attended today um, for your presence and taking the time to be here and for your questions. Um, I want to I put in the chat uh, that you would be more than welcome, please, to join us for the third session in this governance series, which will be next month, uh, in exactly a month on February 24th, which is the foundation's board role, foundation board's role in advocating for your library. So it promises to be another really fun and insightful conversation. So please do join us. If you have any additional questions or any feedback for us, please reach out to us at Library Strategies Consulting at thefriends.org. I have just put that in the chat as well. Um, you can reach us anytime um, via that email or the Library Strategies Consulting website. So thank you again, Beth, Bridget, and Paul. Thank you all for being here um, and spending part of your afternoon with the friends and Library Strategies. Take care. <laughs>